Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today is September 8th, 2022. We continue our series, Chronicles of the Kingdom, with Lesson 35, Cleansing the Sin of the World. We continue our look at the world. You know, in John chapter 1, verse 29, you see John the Baptist say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In last week's lesson, we talked about the world, the world system, and how the redemption of the world is tied to the redemption of mankind. If mankind is not redeemed, then creation is not redeemed. And so I refer back to that lesson. If you're unfamiliar with what we're talking about, please go back to that one. Don't judge what we're saying here without relevant context. So we will be continuing looking at God's plan of removing sin and death from his creation. It has always been God's plan to establish his kingdom and to remove sin and darkness from his creation. It's never been his plan to destroy, as in to annihilate, out of existence. And that was, again, something that we looked at last week. We take that word destroy and we misapply it. But we look at 1 John 3, 8. says, He who sins of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Psalm 72.19 says, And blessed is his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Isaiah 6.3 And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, when you look at those verses about the glory of the Lord being everywhere and filling up the entire earth, it's easy to look around and go, but I don't see glory. I see sin and darkness in the planet. And this is where it's almost a paradox, you know, two things that seem oppositely opposed that are true. But you see, the world, the creation is filled with sin and darkness. But the idea of some sort of total depravity would deny the scriptures where the, the earth is filled with the glory of God. Because if there's glory of God in creation, then how can it be totally depraved of sin and darkness? Well, there's two things going on at the same time. Yes, there is sin and darkness in the world. There's sin and darkness in man. That is true. But there's also the glory of God that is throughout God's creation. It displays his glory. And so we're going to look at some notes about this, and we're going to look at what does it mean to destroy. You look in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. It reads, Thus I shall establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Genesis 9, 11. Now, I read that because here the Lord says, is talking about destroying the world with the flood. The flood destroyed the world, but yet the world was not destroyed. The inhabitants living on the world was destroyed. A system that was on the world was destroyed, but the actual physical planet was not. And yet the word destroyed 
was used there. And so we need to get context when God begins talking about destroying the world. And with that, we're going to look at several verses in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7, and we will be reading all the way down to verse 13. But I'm going to sort of break these up and take these in parts. So starting in verse 7, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. When we see that, that the world is what is saved for a day of judgment, a day of fire, and like that. Judgment and perdition. What does perdition mean? Well, it means destruction. Destruction that creates a loss. And so the world is reserved. The heavens and the earth. Now let's notice that the heavens. It's not talking about the sky and the stars heavens. It's talking about the spiritual realm heaven and the earth are preserved. What? For a fire. A fire, judgment, and perdition. And now what's being judged and destroyed? Ungodly men, of ungodly men. So the judgment of the world, the fire that's going to hit the world, is not about putting fire to the world. It's about putting fire to ungodly men. Again, go back to the destruction by the flood in Genesis. Was it to destroy a physical world or was it to destroy ungodly men? Begin to ponder this, begin to think about it, because we need to continue on. Verse 8 says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing with the Lord. One day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slacking concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but long suffering toward us, not willing any should perish, but all come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, most of that, I was reading a little fast in verse 8 and 9. Those aren't really verses I want to focus on uh, about how long the Lord counts his time, and he's not he's not slacking or he's not holding up. But verse 11 says, The day of the Lord is going to come in at the sea for the night. In other words, we don't know. It's going to surprise us. But, I want to focus on, again, talking about the world, the world system, and in somewhat the heavens. It says the heavens will pass away. That spiritual realm is going to pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it. How do you burn up a work? Well, when you think about it, you mean to go, well, it must be referring to like, If I worked and built a building, the building is the work of my hands, and so that will burn up. And that very logically could be true, but there's something about the fire that God is going to send out. It's not just about the fruit. It's about the actual work. The act itself will be burned up. And we're going to get more into that in a minute. But it says the elements will melt with fervent heat. What does that word elements mean? Well, you know, we can think of, well, you know, it's like the periodic table. There's elements in the earth. There's oxygen and there's hydrogen and there's gold and silver. And, and you know, you know, you got nature people go earth, wind and fire, you know, but you're thinking about some sort of a physical base thing that, everything is is built up to be but that word elements is stoikion in the greek and it means an orderly arrangement a base fundamental the initial serial not serial like something you eat but serial like a number constituent in other words it's a basic foundational principle of an order So when this verse talks about melting the elements, it's not referring to burning up oxygen and uranium and hydrogen and and rocks and water. That's, That's not the elements it's talking about. It's talking about burning up the foundational principles of an order. 
of the basic principles of an arrangement. Those are the elements that are getting burned up. And when you understand that's what that Greek word means, and you sit there and you go back and you, you look at that scripture and goes, the elements, the basic foundational principles of an order will be melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it. Suddenly the works you see is, is what is the work of these basic principles in action. Verse 11 says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You know, again, you look at the word dissolved. What does dissolved truly mean? Does dissolved mean that something is destroyed into annihilation? You know, when you dissolve sugar or salt into water, is the salt and sugar destroyed? No, it's changed. You're chemically changing the water. Those elements of that sugar and salt are still in the water, but they've been changed in the dissolving process where the element of salt, the element of sugar is no longer there. It's now been chemically combined and changed in the water into something else. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's become part of what's there. And here it says what? Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, these these works, these basic principles are going to be dissolved, melted away. These elements, they're going to be changed. And so because they're going to be changed, how much we conduct ourselves. Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. How do we hasten the coming of of the day of God. Well, we hasten it, but how do we conduct ourselves? Because this is about burning up the basic elements, the foundational principles of this darkness that's in the world. Let's look at some other scriptures where the same word, uh, stoikion, uh, or elements, is used in scripture. Hebrews 5.12, <clears throat> excuse me, for when the time you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles or stoikion of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So here's talking about the first principles of the oracles of God. And that, that first principles, we translate that, is the stoikion, those basic elements. So again, if the word was translated elements, um, you need to be taught again the elements of the oracles of God. Here it's first principles. Let's look at Galatians 4.3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That word elements is the stoikion. We're not in bondage to rocks and, and, and those sort of things. We're in bondage to what? The principles, the foundational principles order of the world. Galatians 4, 9, just a few verses down. But now, after you, have, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how do you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements where to which you desire again to be in bondage? Weak and beggarly stoikion. The what? The, this order, basic principles of the world. Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Here, after the rudiments, this is the after the stoikion of the world. The rudiments, what? Again, foundational principles. And then Colossians 2.20. Wherefore, if you are dead in Christ from the rudiments of the world or the elements of the world. This is the stoikion right there. Why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Again, when that word rudiments of the world, it is a stoikion. It's the elements. We don't, we're not seeing this as, again, those physical things. We understand it is the basic principles. And so 
we're seeing in this is established that when the earth is melted away of fire, the elements is not the world. It's the principles of this sinful fallen world that will be uh, destroyed or changed. And so if you remember last week, we looked at Romans 8, 19 through 22. I want to refer to that again. It says, For the earnest expectations of creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Again, we talked a lot about this last week, but I just want to refer to this again, that creation wasn't willingly thrown into bondage. It was subjected to it. It was subjected because it was under the dominion of Adam who gave it away. So creation is now subjected to this darkness. And it says creation will be what? Delivered from this bondage. Why? How? When? When the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, again, redemption of creation is tied to the redemption of man. Why? Because it's about kingdom and dominion. Going back to this 2 Peter 3. Picking up in verse 12. says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So again, we picked up with those last couple of verses. Why? Because I wanted us to see, again, the elements, the, the stoikia, those what basic principles or what's going to be dissolved with fire. This fire is going to dissolve, is going to melt, is going to change these basic principles, this basic order. And we will now look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Before I get to this new heavens and new earth, I want to talk a little bit more about this fire and this cleansing. And I don't have time to really go over it, but man, if you pull up a concordance or you use a computer program and you look, you will see many, many scriptures that use this word refined. And if you're a believer, you've heard the, the term refined in the fire. There's too many verses for me to go on to it. Now in this point, but just uh, just a couple, Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. You know, furnace, things burn. Affliction is, is a hardship. And God said he's refining us in this fire of difficult things. Like he's refining us silver. What does it mean to be refined as silver? Psalm 66, 10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You And there's a lot of scriptures about refined gold and refined silver. What does that mean? Well, when you dig up silver and gold, it's got impurities in it. Our world, you and I, we have sin and impurities in us. And one of the one of the lies the enemy gives us is yes we are sinners we have sin we deal with sin, but God is in a process of refining us. When is that refining? He puts fire to that. When you have gold or silver and you want to get out the impurities, you put it, you melt it, you put it in extreme heat, and those impurities they rise to the top, and then the 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 smith, the goldsmith, silversmith, whatever is making it, will skim off. It calls it the dross. They skim off the dross. They skim off all the impurities. And the more fire, the more heat you put, the more impurities will rise to the top and it can be taken off and you get pure gold, pure silver. God is refining you and I. He is burning out the sin and darkness within us. He's, he's doing this. Daniel 12, 10. 
many shall be purified, made white, and refined. Again, there, I mean, there's so many scriptures that, that use this refining process. And again, we have to understand the figurative language because it's easy to get caught up in, I was saved and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb on the cross. Yes, you are, but that blood of the Lamb is also, in figurative language, compared to fire. It's, it's a fire that burns the sin out of us. It's purifying us. And so the world itself is going to be purified by the fire of God. And what comes out of that is a new creation. Colossians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And many times we see that all things become new and we just want to apply that to just me. I'm the new creation, therefore everything about me is new. And that is true, but the all things that become new is God is making all things in his creation new. And I am going to be in his new creation, therefore I am made new. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 19 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Now here's Isaiah, thousands of years ago, prophesying. Speaking for the Lord, he says, I created a new heavens and new earth. And that's not Isaiah, that's the Lord speaking through Isaiah. He created new heavens and a new earth. And the former, this old earth, this old heaven, will no longer come to mind or be remembered. And he tells us to be glad and rejoice in what he's creating. Behold, I created Jerusalem as rejoicing, and her people a joy, and there won't be any weeping. And we see Jerusalem... And the temptation is to fall into like the Jews that suddenly believe that it's a city and it's going to be a new world and a new city. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, as John saw it, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And it said to me, Write these words are true and faithful. Now here in Revelation, we see that the new Jerusalem coming down is a bride adorned for her husband. We later find out that the bride is the church. The bride is the bride of Christ. The Jerusalem that comes down is not a city. It's the church. It's the church. It's the people that live with God, who God dwells in them and is with them forever. And he wipes away the tears. Why? There's no more weeping. He wipes away the tears. There's joy because these people are a joy to the Lord. And God says, behold. And he's saying, behold what? He's saying, look around. Look at my bride. Look at the earth. Look at the heavens. I've made them new. The old earth, the old fallen, dark, sin label thing is gone. It has passed through fire. It has been refined. What you're seeing is now renewed, restored. This is God restoring the creation that he began in Genesis that fell. He's restoring that. He's going to restore you and I. He's going to restore his creation. And it will not be the same because what was the same won't even be remembered. 
but yet at the same time, it's a restoration. We will become a new creation in a new creation that he has redeemed. And that is God cleansing the sin of the world. Father, we thank you that you love us. We don't always understand some of these things. They seem difficult to comprehend. But we ask that you would teach us, that you would instruct us, God. Father, I thank you, God, that you, when you look down at creation, you see me as an individual, God. You see all of us as individuals. You individually died for us all. And yet, by dying for me individually, you've also died for humankind. You've died to save and redeem your creation, Lord. I know that it just boggles my mind at the work that you're doing that was accomplished on the cross. But God, we thank you for that. And we ask that you continue to redeem and refine us all. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can continue to listen to the series, Chronicles of the Kingdom. Every week, we will put out another lesson, and we'll be doing that throughout the year 2022. You can find them at our website, www.christianimpact.net. And until next time, God bless.